So uh, thanks everybody for, for uh, joining uh, this Magnet seminar. As I sort of mentioned earlier, it's uh, delayed, but better late than, than never. Um, and so for those who haven't um, been to any of the Magnet seminars, um, just a quick outline of um, uh, the, the presentations and you will hear some background noise on my end this morning. So the format of these seminars is, is a, a presentation that's about 25 to, to 30 minutes. And so I kindly ask that you uh, keep your microphone muted during that time so that um, we don't disturb uh, the speaker. And if you are having any problems with the uh, internet connection, if you turn off your video feed, uh, that can help to, to improve things. Um, after the uh, presentation, we'll have time for a 10 to 15 minute question and, and, and discussion session. Um, and if you don't want to, to ask a question um, on Zoom, you can type a question into the chat and um, I will read it out to the uh, to the speaker for you. And as you know, because these are online seminars and we've all got our life going on around us in the background, if you do have to get up and go, please just go. Um, there's a lot of different things going on, so that's not a problem at all. Uh, as I said, these seminars are recorded and, and I'll talk about what, where you can access these recordings at the end of the seminar. And, and at the end of, end of it all, we'll have time uh, for a bit of a catch up, a bit of a social for everybody because we're all uh, at the four corners of the planet. So it's a good chance to, to catch up with everybody. And that part of the seminar uh, isn't actually recorded. So it's, it's, it's a fair free for all for everybody. And so um, today I'm delighted um, to, to uh, introduce Andrew Roberts um, as our uh, speaker for today. This, he is marking the start of a shift um, in our uh, normal timescale for running uh, the Magnet Seminars. So now we're going to be running uh, on a, a European uh, Eastern Hemisphere timescale so that um, our colleagues across the world can have a chance to, to actually participate and interact in these seminars. And so today Andy is going to talk about uh, magnetotactic bacteria. And so without much ado, I will pass over uh, to, to you, Andy. Perfect. OK, Perfect. thanks, colleagues, for coming. And thanks for your patience. Really sorry about that. Um, I've changed my title a little bit. And Greg didn't tell me it was 25 to 30 minutes. So I don't know if I'll keep to that. But, but um, I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, so I'm going to talk about MTB and magnetic fossils. And there are people in the room who know way more than me. Um, and and I, I, I hope you, I, I know that. And I think you know that. So. Um, I offer this talk in that light. And I see my colleague, uh, Lee Jin Hua is in the room as well. And he's done a lot of the work that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and I'm gonna acknowledge that in due course. Um, so MTB, if you look down a microscope and, and Jin Hua also gave me a lot of the graphics for this talk too. So um, I acknowledge that. If you look down a microscope uh, and here's the, the, the droplet of water, and here's the field direction in this. This is what's called a magnetodrome. The bacteria will swim towards the applied field direction, right? So they swim this way and then the applied field switches direction. They swim the other way. You go around in circles and they follow that. Okay, so we all know magnetotactic bacteria in our community. And, you know, this is the classic image of a chain of magnetosomes, either of magnetite or grigite. And it's, it's that long... Uh, chain that provides the, the strong anisotropy along that chain that provides the, 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 bac the bacterial cell with a compass-like needle that enables it to, to navigate along the field. And if you looked at a TEM image of those uh, magnetic particles in a, in a magnetosome chain, uh, they're not independent of each other. They're strongly interacting, but they interact uh, such that they're flux-linked. And so you see a, a large single dipole associated with that single uh, magnetite chain. Uh, this is from electron holography. And, and you know, you might ask yourself, well, how does that actually work? Uh, Aresh uh, Kameli from, from UC Berkeley did this beautiful study where, where these are the magnetosomes. The, mag the magnetosome is the organelle within, within the cell and, and the, the magnetosomal magnetite or grigite resides within that, is biomineralized perfectly and beautifully within that. But the chain structure is held together by these cytoskeletal protein filaments, which, which line everything up. So uh, it's an extremely intricate and, and, and beautiful structure. And the, the standard view of, of where these things live is that they live around oxic anoxic transition zones or oxic anoxic interfaces, OATZ or OII. And the idea is that if you come from the atmosphere down into, into the water column or sediment, you'll have an oxygen gradient from atmospheric levels to, to nothing and an opposing gradient 
of reduced species, um, probably sulfur coming upwards uh, with a negative gradient. And in between, you have this transition zone between oxidizing and reducing anoxic environments. Um, I have a problem with this figure at, at lots of levels. Um, I, I, I love Dennis and, and Richard Frankel. I think they're, they're, they're legends of the field, but I think this depiction is flawed in, in many ways and it's, it's repeated in the literature. So I'll explain why I think that's problematical. But basically the idea is that the, 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 the bacteria swim up and down geomagnetic field lines uh, using their flagellae. And you know, since I started reading this literature 30 years ago, I have all these moments of really, do they really think that? Um, and so uh, in, in the abstract for the talk, I've asked a lot of questions. I, I won't have time to go through all those questions today, but there's a lot of things that make me think, really? How, how does that really work? Um, so th then that's where uh, magnetotactic bacteria uh, live, allegedly. Um, uh, and, but and when they die, uh, the idea is that their, their, their nanomagnetic remains um, get buried in sediment and provide really beautiful ideal magnetic recording of these single domain particles. And that was put forward by Joe Kirschfink, who, who coined the term magnetofossils. And when you look at their paper in 1984, I'm not bagging it, I think it's classic work and have cited it many times, but the quality of the imagery is, is not great compared to, to, to today. Um, um, but a couple of years later, you know, with, with John Stoltz and colleagues, I think Joe was a co-author of that paper, they're producing beautiful images of the type that, that we're, we're more used to. Um, but classic work, and, and the idea was that magnetofossils are supposed to be a, a significant recorder of paleomagnetic information. And throughout my paleomagnetic life, I've said, well, really? To, to lots of questions. So um, my, my first question is, if magnetotactic bacteria live around an OAI, won't diagenesis remove them? Um, it's a redox zonation. And when you get into reducing sediments, sulfitic sediments are corrosive to magnetite, so they should dissolve. So then the question is, do they always inhabit OAI environments? Um, other questions are, when did they appear in the geological record? Does that tell us anything independent about the geodynamo and its evolution? Um, when you see these, these pictures of, of bacteria swimming up and down across a, a redox zonation, I've always wondered, well, why do they do that? You know, why, why do they choose to live there? Um, is that the electron transfer through, through moving through these uh, redox zones, giving them energy for a battery that helps them to metabolize, or are they actually involved in the biogeochemical cycling that, that, that occurs across that, that transition? Um, and, and as a paleomagnetist, we, so some of the questions I posed in the abstract are things like relative paleointensity. If you have detrital and biogenic particles, does, what does that mean for recording efficiency? And we've published a lot of that, so I'd, I'm not going to talk about it today. If, if you want to talk to me about that, happy to do that, that on offline. Um, but, but really, one of the things that, that interests me a lot is, can the morphology of the magnetofossils tell us about the environment? And can we then use that if we find magnetofossils? Uh, can we use that as a, as a paleoenvironmental proxy? So th those are a bunch of questions. And I have lots of other questions, like what happens at the equator? What's the benefit of magnetotaxis at the equator? You know, um, it, all, all sorts of questions come up. We don't have time for a lot of these today, um, um, but, but let's have a go at some of these questions. Um, so some years ago when I, when I decided MTB were more interesting to, to the research questions I was uh, interested in, uh, I hooked up with long-term friend Yongsheng Pan in, in Beijing. Uh, this is Li Jinhua, who, who, who I'll show another picture of, and Ching Song Liu, all great friends. Um, and so we wrote a joint grant together. Dennis Basilinski was involved. And, um, and, and Yongshin brought these two characters into the project, uh, Wei Lin and, and, and Li Jinhua. And um, these guys are proper microbiologists, so, and they've got they're clever and they've got a lot of tools at their disposal that, that really help to address a range of interesting questions. So uh, it's been one of life's great delights for me to work with these guys, um, really interesting science. And when you're bored during COVID, uh, there's been a lot of interesting papers that we've been working on together. And then Jinhua has a student, Pei Yu Liu, who, who, who uh, has done some of the work that I'll talk about today. And, and with Wei, uh, I have a student, Pranami, who's stuck in India at the moment. Um, where COVID is raging and, and she can't get back into China to, to do the dual PhD between 
um, and she can't get to Australia either. So it, it's pretty tough for her. And of course, Greg, thanks for the invitation for the talk. Um, you've changed a bit over the years, as have I, but um, there we go. Um, so my, my view of MTB is that there, um, if you'd asked me any time before 10 years ago, I would have said they're interesting, but not geologically important. Uh, and, and the reason for that is what happens when mud gets buried? When mud gets buried, diagenesis happens. And what is diagenesis? Well, it's simply the, the physical and chemical changes uh, that occur in a, in a sediment as it converts to rock, dewatering, compaction physically, um, but chemically, uh, in particular, organic matter burial is really critical for preservation of paleomagnetic signals. So diagenetic changes uh, result from, from the microbial degradation of organic matter. Um, and if you get into sulfitic environments, magnetite gets dissolved, unprotected magnetite gets dissolved, uh, and much of the paleomagnetic and the paleomagnetic signal carried by, by those unprotected magnetite particles. So organic matter burial is really important. So in, in, in my life, I would say I've become more expert in diagenesis than I wanted to simply because I wanted to understand what was wrecking the records. And um, I'd say diagenesis is ubiquitous. It affects every record. Sometimes it's, it's subtle, sometimes it's pervasive. And, and our job is really to figure out at what end of the spectrum we're operating. Um, so, so here we go. This is the standard um, diagenetic zonation in sediments. Uh, and the depth is arbitrary because uh, this depth could be really thick, uh, tens, hundreds of meters thick, or it could be millimeters thick, depending on organic carbon flux. And so, you know, you, you start with degrading uh, organic matter with oxygen, and when all the oxygen is consumed, then you start to reduce uh, the next species that that uh, is most readily uh, uh, usable. So that's nitrate, then manganese oxides, then iron oxides, then then sulfide, then then methane, right? And so. Um, you get these ranges of, of, of diagenetic zones and different minerals form and, and dissolve. And when you get into this sulfitic realm here, uh, magnetite dissolves, it's unstable. So it's not gonna be preserved. Um, so magnetite is preserved in this oxic to, to nitrogenous to ferruginous zone. Um, and then, and then gregite produces will occur deeper where it's sulfitic. And uh, we, there's not a huge amount of work yet on the gregite producers, which I think is a real pity. Um, I, I expect them to be really common in the geological record, unlike the magnetite producers, but um, that's a hard problem to work on. The particles are, are, are ratty looking, they, they form poor chains, they're poorly crystalline. Uh, that's a, a tricky problem, but I think it's one that deserves attention. But anyway, my view for 20 years was that um, if you're in this redox zonation and the, the magnetofossils are forming here, by the time they bury here, they'll be dissolved. So geologically, they're not interesting. Paleomagnetically, they're not important. And, and uh, 10, uh, 2008, when Bob Kopp and, and Joe Kirschwink published this paper, uh, you would have concluded, I'm right, wouldn't you? You'd say, what well, they, they made a nice statement, the pre-quaternary magnetofossil record is sparse. More magnetofossil bearing localities have been identified in the quaternary than in all the rest of Earth history. Um, and, and so up till 2008, there were very few, um, maybe 10 or so, um, pre-quaternary magnetofossil records documented by Kopp and Kirschman. And what we found since then, um, is actually they're really common um, in all the, and it's not just our group, lots of groups have, have done work, but we've done a lot of work in pelagic marine carbonates. They're ubiquitous in those sediments, uh, various lake sediments, various terrigenous marine sediments. They're really widespread as long as the sediment hasn't become sulfitic. Um, and, and so the question is, is why? Or, uh, why haven't they been dissolved? Um, and so um, Toshi Yamazaki's done some beautiful work in the Pacific Ocean, in the North and South Pacific. This is a, a, a the, the beautiful colors here are chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is an, is, this is from remote sensing. It's a beautiful indicator of surface water productivity. And productivity uh, is limited by various micronutrients. So the plankton in these environments have abundant nitrogen, uh, nitrate, phosphate, 
uh, silica, but they lack iron. So iron is a limiting micronutrient. And if you supply a little bit of iron from dust or, or volcanic ash, you can create a, a phytoplankton bloom. So this area of the North Pacific is, a, is, a, is what they call HNLC, high nitrate, low, low chlorophyll. So you can see low chlorophyll, low productivity, because it's iron limited. Um, and, and what Toshi finds in sediments in, in these HNLC environments in the North and South Pacific is oxygen is easily measurable throughout the sediment column, right down to basement, right? It's 200 micromolar here and 80 at the bottom. So that's not, that's not close to an anoxic transition, yeah? And, and you get these beautiful equant octahedral magnetofossils, all the normal magnetic indicators of their presence. Um, we found the same, uh, uh, Dong Zhang worked in our group for a little while and in Ching Song's group in, in Sustec. And if you look at ferromanganese nodules on the seafloor in the Pacific, again, uh, the magnetic signal in these, in these uh, nodules is carried by biogenic magnetite. And several groups have discovered this almost simultaneously. Um, and, and that's interesting. And, and there's magnetic signals carried by low resolution, but, but um, environmental signals carried by these biogenic magnetites in, uh, in, in, in these nodules. So I would argue that, okay, we're not part of an OAI here, right? It's, it's oxic. Um, it might be nitrogenous in places, um, but you're in the, really the upper part of any redox zonation. So I'm happy to call it that, that these organisms love uh, redox zonations, but this is not an OAI, it's miles above it. Um, so what's, what's the explanation? Well, this is the basic pore water profile that I showed you before with arbitrary depths. And then if you put real depths on them in different environments, this is a high productivity region in the equatorial Pacific from John Tardino's work and, and with pore waters measured. And you can see that sulfide kicks in at 10 meters. So you get a beautiful magnetofossil record for about 10 meters and then it gets dissolved. Uh, uh, North Atlantic uh, Ocean drift deposits uh, is, is uh, still in, in these zones where magnetofossils will be preserved until about 80 meters. Um, so you get beautiful records in those sediments. Uh, and in the North and South Pacific, oxygen penetrates basically to, to the basalt basement. Um, and so you're in different parts of this, this redox zonation. And here you're basically staying up here for the whole thickness of the sediment column. Uh, and here you get there within 10 meters. Okay, so, so that's my view of, of, of what's happening. Um, so to try and understand this better, where else would you go but, but Vegas? So uh, Dave and I uh, went to, to, to Vegas. Um, my, my secretary at the time, time got really excited about putting us in the Bellagio where we had an enjoyable time. My ex-wife, Julia Roberts, tagged along for the trip. Um, and we went to visit Dennis. And I got him chatting about, about uh, you know, what are the, is, is the OAI concept really valid? And it took him back to this paper that he co-authored with, with Blake Moore back in 1985. And they make this statement in it. And um, they use the word microaerobic, right? Optimum cell magnetism occurred under microaerobic conditions. For us geophysicists, that means 10 to the minus six. For, for microbiologists, I learned that day, it means anything less than atmospheric. Yeah. So in this case, what they measured was 1 20th to 1 40th of atmospheric, but it was not uh, anoxic. Yeah. And so there's, there's plenty of back MTB species, as far as I, my understanding, and there's experts in the room who, who could argue with it, but as far as my understanding goes, they're, they're quite happy in those environments. It's less oxygen than, than the atmosphere, of course, um, but, but they're still happy in, in those sorts of environments. And so when we talk about OAIs, um, it, it might, some people might consider this semantics, but it's important for preservation and, and happy to talk about redox gradients, but I think we're miles above an OAI when we're getting stuff preserved in the geological record. This is a nice figure from, from the Munich group. 
and they show it very very well where you know you've got this uh, oxygen level in the water column and then the sediment the oxygen level drops off obviously and the mtb are still still fairly happy at almost atmospheric levels but clearly they, they they're, they're happier when the oxygen levels drop off uh, i don't know how low that is but anyway the, the, there's an environment that's miles above uh, uh, reducing uh, sulfidic um, where, where these guys are happy. Okay, so what are, the, what are the bacteria doing there and for how long have they been doing it? And this is where I, I, I get to pump up the tires of Jinhua a little bit because I think the work that he's been doing is just stunning. Um, and, and the problem when we come to do this sort of work is that there are really very few species that are cultured in the lab, only three or four or five, I don't know how many, but it's small. Uh, so to, to make progress, we need to work with dirty environmental samples. And then you've got hundreds, thousands of species in the same, in the same sample. So how, how do you handle them? Um, and so Jinhua has come up with a workflow that, that I think is magic. Um, it combines fluorescence microscopy um, hybridization with these with these probes um, and SEM and TEM imaging. SEM imaging these days with field emission systems is really, really very good. But of course, the TEM images are so much better. Um, but the, the four steps of this are to enrich um, in your microcosm the, the, the MTB cells from, from the environmental sample. Then you do gene sequencing of them. Uh, then you do this fluorescence uh, in situ hybridization analysis. Um, which enables you to tag these with different markers so that you can see which species are, are the same, uh, which strains are the same, and then, and then you, you, you can image them and then characterize the magnetic particles. And, and, and so you can do the whole thing. You, you get the phylogeny, you, you, you get the morphology of the cell and the number of uh, particles and the, the configuration, single strand, strand, double strand, quadruple strand, chain bundles, whatever, non-chained. And, and then you get the... the um, the morphology. Okay, so the, the, the steps that, that, that are taken is that you go to your environment, wherever it might be, swamps, coastal environments, lakes, deep sea, um, and you've got this complexly mixed sample with all of these different types of, of bacteria. You, you do the phylogenetics to, to, to understand, you know, where these guys fit in, in, in the scheme of life. Um, and then you characterize. And so, you know, the morphology and the composition, we use transmission electron microscopy, um, scanning transmission electron microscopy, synchrotron stuff, nanosims, et cetera. And you, you get a holistic view uh, of, of what's going on. And I think Jinhua and, and, and colleagues do a really stunning job of this. And so then in terms of interpretation, you've got the ecology, you've identified the species, um, then you can understand the biomineralization, measure the magnetic properties. Um, and so to go from, from these two-dimensional images of, morpholo of morphology, of course, that's a cross-section, uh, the electron beams transmitting through those particles. And what you're trying to do is to understand the shape of the particles. So they tilt the stage through many, many angles to get a tomographic image to build these 3D crystal structures of, of the, the, the the, the magnetite particles. And then um, based on, on, on this kind of stuff, you can start to, to, to think about interpreting magnetofossil records. Um, most of what we see as, as paleomagnetists is this. And I'm very interested that we, we come to an understanding of this in the modern so that we can constrain this in the ancient. Um, and it's, it's turning out this is incredibly complicated and it's going to take a long time to work out, but I, I think it's fundamental and has to be done. Okay, so, so what we're finding is that the, the phylogeny is incredibly diverse, uh, multiple phyla. Um, you see single stranded guys, you see double stranded, you see double double stranded, you see you know, chains at angles, you see chain bundles. Uh, you see these watermelon things with multiple chain bundles. The, the diversity is incredible in terms of the, the type of bacteria, the cocky versus the, the, the MTB, the, the, the types of particles they produce, the inclusions. You can see there are inclusions within these of different types. Um, and, and that's all playing into this incredible phylogenetic diversity. So, you know, if you went uh, before 2012, uh, it was thought that there were two phyla 
uh, uh, in which MTB originated. Then between 2012 and 2015, three. Then 2015 to 2020, five. And just last year, it's, it's ballooned. And um, uh, I mean, every time these guys go and look down their microscopes and do the phylogenetics, they're finding new species. And, and the phylogeny is, the diversity of the phylogeny is expanding incredibly. Um, so, so one of the problems in this that, that I've started to read about and I find really interesting is, is a thing called horizontal gene transfer. So, you know, we're, most of us, I think, are probably used to thinking about biology in, in these terms as a tree of life where there's vertical inheritance of DNA and, and evolution happens vertically, uh, starting with the, 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 the last universal common ancestor. Um, but what horizontal gene transfer says is that particularly prokaryotes can transfer genetic information horizontally. So unrelated organisms can transfer genetic material um, through, through this HGGT mechanism. So really it makes understanding of evolution messy. And, and then if, if that's happening, you could say, well, how do, how do we know the reality? But there, there are rules that, that they put around this and all of the work that's being done around this meets those rules. Um, so it's leading to a, a more complex view of, of evolution in, in, in these, these things. So I, I'm curious to see how that evolves, but um, okay, what do I know? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a paleomagnetist, but I, I'm inclined to think it's real for, for lots of reasons that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about soon. So then, then the question is, when did MTB evolve and Jinhua gave me this image I'm not sure where it's from there were anyway um, um, but you know we're used to seeing magnetofossils in the Cenozoic and in the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum 56 million years ago there's lots of them and, it, and most records have lots of them uh, and then in the Cretaceous in southern England in chalks they're abundant and in the deep ocean they're abundant then go back in time there's a lot of controversy around the gunflink Gunflint shirt, probably people in the room are working on that and, and they consider it putative, the, the evidence is controversial. Um, and then of course, there's the Martian meteorite, the Allen Hills meteorite that, that has a date of 3.9 to 4 billion years. And the argument is that uh, Martian magnetofossils hitched a ride on a meteorite and, and, um, and seeded MT, MT, MTB on earth. Um, so, Wei Lin did a really beautiful um, study. Greg was a co-author on this a few years ago. I, I, I wasn't, but they used Bayesian uh, molecular clock dating and found that the magnetosome gene clusters, these are the things that, that are responsible for, for biomineralization and chain arrangement within magnetosomes, originated before or near the divergence between the nitrous spirate and the proteobacteria. That means that was in the Archean, right? And, and that is before the great oxidation event. So we're used to thinking of bacteria in the modern where we have oxygen in the atmosphere, but now if we're pushed into the Archean, very little oxygen in the atmosphere. And then what's the advantage of having magnetotaxis if there's no geomagnetic field? So it's suggesting an antiquity of the field and providing an independent line of evidence that's very exciting about understanding the geodynamo. So I think that's very cool. And so we, we've, we've got a job to do to, to really trace that in the magnetofossil record, which I think is very exciting. Um, then the question is, well, were they, were they living across an OAI in a world where there's, where there's no O? Um, and some people have come up with evidence that there were you know, um, OAIs in the, in the shallow ocean in, in, in that world, but it's controversial. Uh, and, and so we don't know. Clearly it was some sort of redox gradient. Uh, so that's the way I prefer to think about their, their habitats rather than, 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 than that way. Then, you know, this nanotomography of tilting the TEM stage and, and, and imaging and then putting through a crystal model to, to come up with the, the, the details of the geometry of the particles produces these, these very beautiful images of, of, of the, the diversity of not only the bacteria and the chain arrangements uh, and, and all the rest, but of the, the, the magnetosomal magnetite as well. So, you know, by this really detailed work on, on individual particles and, and getting the nanotomography, even, you know, going down to the atomic level and then picking out the, the, the details of the crystallography of, of the individual crystals, then we can tie that to, to the phylogenetics. And, and here, the colors correspond to five different phyla, 
okay and i'm just keeping it that way so that you can see that you know that the bacteria themselves are diverse the chain arrangements and the numbers of particles are, are diverse the particle types are diverse and then the crystal models you can see so so the argument is that for these deep branching nitrospire you've got these hard aligned uh, uh, particles uh, bullet shaped particles and and you've got less complex more regular uniform shaped in these later branching particles but what you what you see is that uh, there's a general similarity in morphology in each phylum and then variability within each strain and so this is a this is a, a map of uh, I forget what is some statistical measure forget what it is but anyway the, the point is you, you're putting the distributions of, of measured uh, crystals uh, and sure, some of them are very similar, but the, there's the, the argument is that there's sufficient diversity uh, and amongst different phyla that there's some hope, I would argue, that, that at least at phylum level, and if you know what the, what the genes are telling you about what their function is in the environment, there's some hope of getting a, a, a paleoenvironmental proxy um, from these things. So that's pretty exciting. Still a lot of work to be done because the number of, of strains for which we have this level of information is 20 odd. Um, so it's still a lot, a lot to do. Um, then, then the question is by, by geochemical cycling. I, I, I talked about them swimming up and down field lines, but really why? Um, and, and the more species you look at you know, and do elemental maps, this is a standard TEM image and then carbon, oxygen, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, iron, et cetera. And then, then a, a color map of all of them. You can see the cell is carbon based. The, the, the iron uh, from the magnetite is, is there, um, but you see all this other stuff. Here, they're, they're polyphosphate inclusions with calcium and magnesium. Uh, this guy's got sulfur globules in the cell. Uh, this guy's got poly, polyphosphates um, in the cell. So the question is, what, what, what is all of that? Yeah, and, and so this is an idealized image. Um, some, some, um, some strains have what are called ferrosomes. They're storing iron in, in other forms apart from uh, magnetosomal magnetite or, or grigite uh, and, and various other things within the cell. And there are other bacteria that, that, that perform redox functions in, in, in the water column and in sediments. These are things called cable bacteria, which are very cool. They're up to a couple of centimeters long and they, their base is in the, in the, in the sulfitic sediment and their top is in the oxic sediment and they're, they're facilitating electron transfer, transfer in, in redox reactions. Um, there are other giant sulfur bacteria that, that swim out of um, nitrogenous into sulfitic and, 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 and back and forwards. These things are weird. They can swim at 60 times their body length per second. They're some of the fastest bugs going. Um, so so the, these organisms are involved in, in, in redox chemistry in, 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 in diagenetic environments. So if you look at, again, you're used to this by now, these are the, 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 the different phyla and different strains. Um, if you look at, at the gene content and the metabolic pathways that, that they're able to, 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 to follow, um, the, the black circles indicate that they have the genes for the full pathway. So clearly you'd expect them to be able to cycle iron and, and most of them you'd expect to cycle nitrogen. Uh, gray means they've got incomplete pathways and, and, and white means absent. But, but, but the point is that, that the, they've got the genetic content to be able to be involved in biogeochemical cycling. Um, I mean, humans have 98% of our genetic content is, has no function, right? So it could be that, that the genetic content is just there vestigially and, and not playing a role, but you know, swimming up and down magnetic fields across uh, a, a, a redox boundary, when you've got all of this chemical equipment to make the most of it, 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 it seems a bit far-fetched that they're, they're not doing that to me. So the proposal has been made in, in, in these papers that, that they're shuttling up and down and being involved in sulfur oxidation when they swim up, nitrate accumulation within the microoxic zone. And then when they swim down, they're involved in sulfide oxidation, sulfate reduction, nitrate re reduction within the anoxic zone. And then the argument with these different um, inclusions within the cell 
that they're involved in the geological sequestration, not just of magnetosomal part, um, magnetic particles, but sulfur, uh, carbonate, uh, phosphate, uh, et cetera. Um, so the really interesting thing will be to see if eventually a budget can be produced to see how significant MTB are in the global biogeochemical cycling of elements. Um, we just don't know, uh, but it's an interesting question. Okay, so I've gone on long enough, I'll, I'll stop. Um, I, I would argue that the OAI, OAI model for MTB is important, um, but overemphasized. Um, and and I'd, like to, I'd like to see us be a bit more sophisticated about that. Um, I'm probably whistling in the wind with that because it's, it's just so embedded a concept. I'd say MTB evolution really adds an important dimension to understanding the, the dynamo, and, and that's pretty cool. Um, they're incredibly diverse, uh, um, but with that diversity, it seems that each phylum has distinct morphologies and each species within a phylum has variations on that morphotype. So I think there's hope for, for um, developing paleoenvironmental proxies, but as I say, you know, you have to do this kind of work for lots and lots and lots of living species in order to infer back into the, the geological record. So that's work that's ongoing, lots to be done, but that's a, that's a quick snapshot of some of the things that, that we, uh, Jinhua and, and others and colleagues have been thinking about over the last few years and, and really enjoying. So thanks. Thanks very much, Andrew. I think we can all um, give Andrew a virtual round of applause for a, a really interesting talk covering a lot of different aspects of, of NTB. Um, I can open the floor now to questions. So if anybody has a question, you can uh, raise your hand um, uh, via Zoom or you can type it into the, uh, the chat. So we'll start with uh, Adrian Muxworthy. Well, uh, thanks very much for the talk, Andrew. It's really, really good. I've, I've learned a lot. I, I just have a question. This is more for sort of for looking at this from a paleomagnetic point of view. We often focus on MTB, but my experience working in the North Sea, there's an, also, an awful lot of extracellular cellular bio, you know, biogenic magnetite as well. Um, I'm just wondering if we're focusing too much attention. I mean, MTBs obviously is the whole things we can do looking at the evolution, et cetera. But if we fo from a paleomagnetic point of view, are we focusing too much on MTBs and not looking at other forms of biogenic generation of magnetite or other magnetic minerals? Agree 100%. And, and Jinhua is in the audience still, I hope. So... This is something he and I've been talking about and got some ideas about. I, I, I think the reason we are where we are is because, you know, of the beautiful crystallinity and stoichiometry of the MTB. So they're dead easy to spot. Uh, and the extracellular stuff's a lot trickier. It's, it's quite diverse. Um, I think it's really common. Uh, Jinhua's actually got the evidence. <laughs> So, so that's something that we have to do. I think it's on his next on his agenda, but I don't want to speak for him. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but, but totally agree, really important. And you know, Ramon, when he started his unmixing stuff 15 or so years ago, um, has, has that D plus EX, detrital plus extracellular um, component. Um, and I think extracellular is, is likely much more common and important than we give it credit. We live in interesting times. There's lots more to be done. Yeah. So do we have uh, any other questions for, for Andrew? Uh, yeah. You should, I uh, might want to minimize the um, paper that's on your screen, Andrew. And then we can pan, hand over to, to Wynne. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. Learn. I, I thought I, I knew lots about the detected bacteria, but obviously, obviously not. <laughs> so that was uh, amazing. And um, it, most of this work uh, actually, from my point of view, seems non uh, paleomagnetic in a way, because it, all, all the effort that needs to be done is, is in the biogeochemistry. But uh, is there any hope, do you think, of identifying the sort of or major differences in species from a, a rock magnetic or paleomagnetic point of view? 
Oh, there you get me onto a less optimistic note. Um, um, you're 100% right. There's a lot of fundamental microbiology, genomics, uh, characterization work, and the magnetic characterization goes with it. Um, yeah, there's so much overlap in magnetic properties between different types um, that I, I mean, I, I still think you can tell biogenic magnetite. You, you know, you were you were there for Ramon's talk at the Santa Fe meeting recently, and and um, the complexity of of you know we're used to thinking of single chained bacteria. And then once you get the multi-stranded, multi-chained, uh, looping back on itself chains, all those other geometries that are producing non-central rich signatures and forks and, and all the rest of it. Um, well, it, it's an interesting time to characterize that stuff, but there's a lot more work to be done to do it. And I suspect we'll be in a, a big non-uniqueness situation. But we've got that anyway. Yeah, thanks. Right? Yeah. We've got that anyway. What's that? Let's not kid ourselves. We've got a big non-uniqueness problem anyway. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but a pathway to try and and, and 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 somehow characterize in a broad sense the kind of differences would be nice. I mean, you've got a huge range in morphology of the of the magnetosomes, uh, particularly you know the bullet ones that you think would 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 have less magnetic flux linkage to their neighbors because you know they're going to a point. Rather than on flat surfaces that are interacting, they, they you might be, as they, as as complete magnetos um, magnetotactic bacteria, of course. Yeah, you might think but they also tend to be aligned along one one one, so it's the hard axis. So yeah. you need many many more of them to get the same the same function. Yeah, yeah. So the, you know, and and they're in the oldest branching nitrospire dominantly. So so it kind of makes sense that that they didn't know what they were doing then. You know, I don't know, but. Yeah. Oh, one more question while you're here. Is it really true that the Martian meteor had magnetic? Because <laughs> I've always told the students it's all crystallization of uh, magnetite on, on the rim of carbonate cells. You, did you miss the Santa Fe meeting where they invited... Um, oh, I must have been asleep, sorry. <laughs> Thomas Kapertra to, to talk. She was great. And I was sitting next to Richard Harrison, and um, she gave a lovely talk, and very rigorous, very understated... Um, you know, characterizing these particles and doing a fine scientific job. And I left, like you, unconvinced. And Richard was chattering with excitement that was totally convinced that, that there were magnetic fossils in Mars. All right. So it's still an open question. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, do we have time for another question for, for Andrew from anybody? If not, I will, I will throw one to you. In terms of, of from a, a paleomagnetic perspective, um, what do you think is the next sort of stage in, in understanding um, MTB contribution to, to uh, magnetic recording? In terms of next stage, I'm not sure. In terms of rock magnetism, I think, distinguishing vortex signals from super vortex signals is really important. Um, and when you get flux closure structures with magnetosome chain collapse, those super vortices become important. Um, but I think super vortices are really important in igneous rocks of all sorts of, of descriptions too. So I, th I think that's a characterization issue that's a challenge to us. Um, I think in terms of paleomagnetism, you know, magnetofossils are recording a lot of signals that are really nice, right? The ideal single domain particles. So, so there's nothing not to like about them. Um, and the, I think they're really rather common where you have good records. Um, for me, the biggest excitement is, is trying to push it back in time and get into the Archean. And I've just had a proposal declined on that. So I'm a bit salty. So I have one, one uh, last quick question from, from Andre, and then we'll um, wrap it up for this morning or this evening. Uh, you're, you're on mute, Andre. Can you un unmute, Andre? Uh, I'm sorry. 
Yeah. Sorry, Greg. Yeah. All, always forgetting to do that. Uh, and it's great, uh, great talk. Th uh, thank you, Greg, for uh, getting entered uh, to this audience. Uh, and to be quick, uh, you know, in, in many studies of uh, bacteria in culture, we know uh, from lots of studies uh, of uh, bacteria in culture, we know that the magnetite degrades pretty fast, uh, even on human uh, time scales. How, how does it, uh, what mechanism you see to, uh, for it to survive in essentially just within the magnetite uh, uh, stoichiometry uh, in the geological time scale. Really good question, Andre. And nice to see you. It's been a long time. Yeah. Um, um, it's and it's great to see so many friends that I haven't seen for a while. Um, um, so, you know, if you go into pelagic carbonates, for example, or, or red clays in the North Pacific or South Pacific, like Toshi Yamazaki studies, you'll hardly see a Verwe transition, but you'll see all of the signatures of chains and single domain particles and the strong uniaxial anisotropy. So that's probably severely maghematized, but the basic magnetic properties are preserved apart from the, you know, the Verwe transition. Um, um, and, and that's even in sediments that have been oxidized for 80, 100 million years. So it gives me hope that if, and, and then the question is, you know, how, how well preserved are these signals? What, what mechanisms are keeping them preserved? Some people would say that the, the you know, the organ, the, the, the cell wall as it degrades might be getting mineralized. And I don't know, I, I, find, I, I can't think of a mechanism that I understand or that convinces me, but th that might be protecting it from, from the ravages of time. Um, but, but you're right, it's a good question, and I don't think people have done enough work on it. Well, j um, uh, just to continue, sometimes we do see where it, uh, we still see where we transition in, let's say, several tens of million, um, uh, um, uh, million years old samples. So it's not universal. Yeah, but, but like, bacteria, remember the Verwe transition is seen easily in coarse materials and, yeah. and not so easily in fine well, materials. Uh, it's not grain size dependent, it's just yeah. it's the oxidation of this, the finer particles. Yeah, I agree. I agree on that. But uh, okay, you, you do see the difference in Verwe uh, in the record. Uh, Bit, um, between uh, MTBs and uh, normal detrital, uh, det yeah. detrital magnetite, you can tell it. Uh, yeah, so, so we published a paper in 2013 in JGR, Liao Chang was the first author, yeah. where we looked at low, low temperature results for pelagic carbonates uh, of all sorts of types, and you got stuff with no verwe transition to stuff yeah with I, uh, yeah transition. i agree on that fully but it's not universal yeah it's not and, universal yeah and, and neither maybe, should you expect it to be yeah. because of oxidation yeah yeah and maybe the the last uh, stint on that uh, uh i can't recall if anybody tried to determine this the cell uh, uh cell lattice parameter from this oxidized stuff uh, using the high resolution t team. Do what, you know? What parameter? What the, parameter? Uh, the lattice parameter for for the for magnetite to make hemite crystals in there. Ca Does can you change? see that they are going to the maghemite side? Uh, side? Uh, I'd have to ask Jinhua, but yeah. you know. We, we tend to focus on the on the beautiful stuff, right? The modern. <laughs> yeah, right. But well, that's what we're working on. Now. Yeah, but, 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 but in the geological record, when we've done lattice fringes, they've they've been magnetite. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. It was great to Thanks. see you. Same. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I think we'll, we'll uh, draw the questions to a close, but uh, we thank Andrew again for uh, another uh, fantastic presentation on MTB. Thank so you. Um, before we bring the whole meeting to a close, just a, a few points of, uh, of schedule. Um, so we have another Magnets meeting uh, next week. 
um, which is coming from uh, Gemma Richardson from uh, the British Geological Survey. And she's going to be talking about uh, space weather. Now, the timing of that's going to be a little bit later. And it's going to be at 9 a.m. Um, British summertime. Um, just we're going to have a bit of flexibility in the timing here to accommodate the uh, speakers. Um, but we're always interested in, in uh, more speakers. So if anybody here um, is interested in uh, giving a presentation for the magnet seminars or know of somebody who would um, give a good presentation, please just um, drop myself or, or, or Anita uh, an email. Um, and I should also say that for the, the recordings of these videos, they are um, uploaded um, onto Earthref and they're given a, a citable DOI. So if Andy has talked about something uh, really interesting today and you want to, to use his talk, it will be given a DOI so you can cite it. The videos are, are available to download there. Um, and um, all the videos will be uploaded uh, onto uh, our YouTube channel as well. So um, for those of you who have missed some of the early magnet seminars, you can get all the, all, all the videos up there uh, as well. And I just want to say um, thank you to everybody for um, joining this week's magnets and I'll hope to see you all uh, next week. Cheers. Thanks, Greg.